My name is Anne Kendigsmark, and I'm an English teacher, a writer, and a former journalist. And now I am your host for Cocktail Party Takeaways, a podcast for anyone with regrets, but not deep ones, about the books they slept through in high school. The American Dream. Did you know that phrase has its own Wikipedia entry? But then, so does a toilet plunger, so maybe that's a low bar. The American Dream is defined as the national ethos of the United States, a set of ideals in which liberty means the freedom to prosper, to move upward. The American Dream turns a simple equation into an ironclad contract. Work hard, be successful. End of story. Almost everyone has at least one person in their extended family or in their ancestry who embodies this ideal, a first-generation grandparent, your second cousin twice removed, who hit it big in the first dot-com boom, your wife's brother's father-in-law with the chain of successful pizza joints. In this episode, I will take you through everything you need to know about the novel of the American dream, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. As always, spoilers ahead, so if you need to reread The Greatest American Novel, because of course you've already read it, then hit pause and rejoin us when you're ready. The American Dream is in the news almost every day. A recent headline reads, Bitcoin revives the American Dream. Oh wait, that was in Bitcoin magazine. But as baked into our national zeitgeist as the phrase is, The term, the American dream, is actually quite new, relatively speaking. Coined in 1931, James Truslow Adams defined it in his tome, The Epic of America, as that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone, with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. It is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position. Of course, the ideas embodied in that definition go back to our founding. We remember these words from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's interesting that The Great Gatsby is considered the American dream novel, considering Gatsby takes the shady route from rags to riches, tries to get with another man's wife, and then dies alone, murdered, not for something he has done, but instead in a case of mistaken identity. But I will argue that Gatsby is, indeed, one of the great dreamers of all time, and that he dreams in a quintessentially American kind of way. So let's go ahead and talk about why I think he is great. Gatsby is great because he tries to impose order and purpose on a chaotic, meaningless world. In the words of narrator Nick Carraway on page two, if personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about Gatsby, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life. He had, Nick continues, an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person. When I was in college at the University of Pennsylvania, yes, that was a total flex, but at least I didn't say Harvard, I took an abnormal psychology class with Martin Seligman, the happiness guru, although he was not yet known as that. Seligman spoke one day about what he called the disease of sloth, and honestly, it changed my life, but that's a story for another time. In his lecture, he quoted the essayist Robertson Davies, who describes the, quote, failure in the art of life as loss of interest in really important things. Davies is so serious about the dangers of this loss that he associates it with one of the seven deadly sins, sloth not in the sense of sluggishness or laziness. This is, quote, the wet weather of the soul. He says people get this way because of a dread fear of pain. 
if you cannot feel pain at some of the harsh circumstances of life, he writes, it is very likely that you have ceased to feel joy. And while it may seem clear why some people would go to great lengths to avoid pain, what is more remarkable, Davies argues, is that some people will also go out of their way to avoid joy. We do this, quote, because we are afraid that great exaltation may betray us in some actions, some words, which may make us look a little foolish to people who are not sharing our experience. So we often stifle our moments of joy. And then, of course, joy ceases to visit us. This, to me, is the essence of Gatsby. He is not afraid to feel joy, and he suffers greatly as a result. This is why I fell a little in love with him when I first began teaching the book. So here is my question. Is this a quintessentially American trait? Could Gatsby only happen in America? I could spend nine podcast episodes and then nine more going through all the little things I love and all the little treasures of illusion and symbolism contained in this slim little marvel of a book. But this podcast is about takeaways, so I'm going to control myself. Still, because the book is neatly partitioned into nine chapters, I plan to take you through the book chapter by chapter, and that's going to take some time. So let's call this episode one of a Gatsby series of cocktail party takeaways. I mean, the man was all about throwing cocktail parties, so he deserves more than one episode. Oh wait, that brings me to my first takeaway. Did you know that Jay Gatsby doesn't drink? Not one drop in the whole book. So that Leonardo DiCaprio meme is a whole lot of nonsense. You know the one. Chapter One. He adored New York City. To him, it was a metaphor for the decay of contemporary culture. The same lack of individual integrity that caused so many people to take the easy way out was rapidly turning the town of his dreams and... It's going to be too preachy. I mean, you know, let's face it, I want to sell some books here. Whoops. Wrong chapter one. Chapter one. The Great Gatsby opens with our narrator, Nick Carraway, explaining a bit about himself and the tale he is about to tell. Like me, Nick may have been a little bit in love with his summer neighbor, Jay Gatsby, but we will get to that later. At the beginning of the book, he is looking back on the summer of 1922 when he rented a small house in West Egg on Long Island. Your first takeaway, well, second, after the fact that Gatsby doesn't drink, is that geography. The eggs, West and East Egg, are fictional, but they appear to be based on Great Neck. So this is not the Hamptons, people. This is more of a commuter town. When the story begins... Nick is settling in and observes that the house next to him is basically a McMansion, a giant tacky mess that, to his snobbish taste, smacks of new money. The first real scene in the novel takes place across the so-called Courtesy Bay in East Egg, which is apparently far cooler, the money far older. Here lives his cousin Daisy and her husband Tom. This scene exquisitely sets the stage for practically everything that is to come. We learn that Tom is an unhappy, restless, racist baby. He is having an affair and everyone knows it. We learn that Daisy wants to be perceived as light and insubstantial as swirled cotton candy, but behind her batting lashes is a deep resentment of Tom in her life. We learn that her best friend, Jordan Baker, is similarly made of fairy dust and sparkles and might be flung on Nick as a romantic pairing. The Buchanans didn't move to East Egg. They drifted there for no apparent reason. And Nick speculates that they will, quote, be forever seeking. As they settle in around the dinner table, Jordan suggests with a yawn, we ought to plan something. To which Daisy responds, sure. And then says, what do people plan? This is Fitzgerald at his finest that razor wit that can take four ordinary words and give us ocean depths of meaning. Daisy does not see herself as people. She doesn't know how to make a plan or think about anything beyond the candles on her sunstruck patio dinner table, which she doesn't like and snaps them out, simply because she doesn't have to think about anything. That's what money buys, total presence. So all those gurus preaching to us about living in the now clearly miss the easy answer. Just have a huge pile of clams. Tom is described as a high school football star whose best days are behind him 
and for whom everything afterward savors of anticlimax. Nick says he has a powerful and cruel body. The first words out of Tom's mouth, spoken as he surveys his perfect lawn, are, I've got a nice place here. Wow, I hate him already. But don't spend all that hatred on the initial image. Come for the elitist nonsense, but stay for the blatant racism. Civilization's going to pieces, he blusters over dinner. It's up to us, who are the dominant race, to watch out or these other races will have control of things. Daisy makes fun of him, saying he's getting very profound because he reads deep books with long words in them. But she doesn't object, per se, nor does anyone else. Gosh, how do we track down the roots of systemic racism? It's so sneaky and hidden. So let's insert a little historical background here. Much of the information I'm going to share with you comes from E. Digby Baltzell's seminal work, The Protestant Establishment, published in 1963. Baltzell was another of my UPenn professors. So hurrah, hurrah, Pennsylvania, ya. And again, thanks mom and dad for the great education. Baltzell is famous for popularizing the acronym WASP, which stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You know, the bros who ruled this country from its founding until well into the 20th century. So Baltzell tells us that after World War I, Woodrow Wilson and his high ideals for the U.S. to lead by example and be the world's moral political policeman went out the window. Under Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, isolationism reigned. And in turning away from the world, Americans turned their attention toward their wallets, and the pursuit of monetary success became an essential American value. As Baltzell states, it is no wonder that, during the 1920s, the business establishment, particularly the statesmen of big business, attained a position of authority and public adulation unique in the nation's history. 1920 ushered in the era of prohibition, and it was ambitious recent immigrants, shut out of more traditional ladders to success, who seized the opportunity that the new law created. They became the liquor traffickers, the bootleggers. At the same time, a feverish nationalism was setting in, President Harding put in place a temporary ban on immigration. In 1924, President Coolidge made those restrictions permanent. This was the end of the era of mass immigration into the United States. And let's be clear, these, quote, nationalist sentiments excluded, like, everyone. Italians, Jews, Catholics, you name it. Baltzell dubbed the 1920s the last Anglo-Saxon decade, because those guys spent that decade aggressively asserting their supremacy. Status became paramount, where you went to college, what clubs you belonged to, where you summered, using summer as a verb, all that stuff. Enter the writers, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, Dos Passos, Faulkner, Thomas Wolfe. They were all born within five years of each other. These writers seemed to sense the impending doom of this decade and wrote about it. They couldn't shake the existentialist nightmare that World War I wrought upon their delicate poetic psyches. No matter how good things seemed in the early 1920s, all they could see was death, death, death. That's why Gertrude Stein called them the lost generation. So why am I telling you all this? To tell you that Tom Buchanan is the king wasp. He is the top dog, but he's nervous about it. And that is a dangerous combination. So let's get back to the story. When Jordan learns Nick is living in West Egg, she says, you must know Gatsby. And Daisy immediately demands, Gatsby? What Gatsby? Hmm. The evening ends in seedy pieces with Tom's woman in New York calling nonstop, you know, on the very loud landline, and Daisy speaking about her baby like it's a hat she's sort of fond of. Nick goes home faintly grossed out. For all of the crackling dialogue, the indelible characters, and the perfectly timed storyline, don't miss Fitzgerald's breathtaking descriptions, especially of the natural world. At the end of the chapter, Nick sits in his car for a while, quote, confused and a little disgusted by the evening, and he observes, the wind had blown off, leaving a loud, bright night with wings beating in the trees and a persistent organ sound as the full bellows of the earth blew the frogs full of life. It is in this moment that Nick catches his first glimpse of his neighbor, 
who is standing and regarding the, quote, silver pepper of the stars. He then stretches his arms toward the dark water, seeming to tremble as he gazes out into the black night. The only thing Nick can see as he follows his sight line is the number one takeaway of the book, even though it's the third one I've mentioned, a single green light that might have been at the end of a dock. Spoiler alert, it's Daisy's dock. The first two cocktail party takeaways in chapter two are on the first page. Let's read the first paragraph. About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm, where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens, where ashes take the form of houses and chimneys and rising smoke, and finally, with a transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of gray cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak, and comes to rest, and immediately the ash gray men swarm up with leaden spades and stir up an impenetrable cloud which screens their obscure operations from your sight. Next is the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, blue and gigantic. It's a billboard, an old one, faded and graying into the gray landscape it inhabits. The oculist who put it there is long gone, the narrator assumes, or has sunk himself into eternal blindness, a.k.a. death. So, when I teach Gatsby, I, of course, highlight all these many symbols, the green light, the valley of ashes, the eyes of T.J. Eckelberg. I ask students to imagine exactly what these objects and places stand for or symbolize, if they do indeed mean more than the face value. I'll come back to the green light, but it seems fairly obvious that a valley of ashes is supposed to mean something. I mean, is it even real? Like, is it actually a valley of ashes? I presume it is some early 20th century nightmare of a dumping ground for the waste generated by burning coal. But clearly it's supposed to mean something. The people there, covered in ash, who are, quote, already crumbling. This is the working man who keeps those glittering mansions warm, clean, and comfortable. In the Valley of Ashes, they literally are their work because that is how the privileged who pass through here between the eggs in Manhattan see or don't see the people who live there gray, waste, already dead. And who lives in this shadow of death? Of course, Tom Buchanan's mistress, the smoldering wife of a washed up car mechanic. So what about those eyes? When you think of eyes watching over everything, what do you think of? God, of course. But perhaps this is a bit of a warning flare. The God watching over things in this story is a forgotten advertisement. And what could be more fake and more American than an ad? And this God is living in a literal land of ash. Is there anything more symbolic of death than ashes? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Don't make me go there. You got this, people. In chapter two, Tom takes Nick into the city. And on the way, they pick up his girl, Mrs. Wilson. They wind up throwing a wild party in upper Manhattan at Mrs. Wilson's pied-à-terre, clearly hers, courtesy of Tom. A few cocktail party takeaway things of note here. A party goer asks Nick where he lives, and when he says West Egg, he is again asked if he knows Gatsby. The inquirer confides, they say he's a nephew or a cousin of Kaiser Wilhelm's. This is the first of many rumors that swirl around Gatsby. Then she says, I'm scared of him. I'd hate to have him get anything on me. Huh. This does not jibe with the elegant romantic strolling coolly out on his lawn on a starry night to stare longingly at a light on a dock, does it? So the party heats up, everyone is hammered, and Tom and Myrtle get into it about whether or not Myrtle is allowed to say Tom's wife's name. So she starts shouting, Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. I'll say it whenever I want to. Daisy, day, Making a short, deft movement, Tom Buchanan broke her nose with his open hand. Whew. Okay, note, he does not merely slap her. 
he breaks her nose without making a fist. And Nick uses his whole name to assure that we remember this is the same elitist windbag introduced in the last chapter who thinks civilization is going to pieces. Gee, I wonder why. But perhaps most important is when you flip back a few pages and note that a similar scene went down with Daisy. In an uneasy jest, she says she married a brute of a man, a great, big, hulking, physical specimen. And he says, I hate the word hulking, even in kidding. And Daisy says, hulking. Does she get a broken nose? No, she does not. Final takeaway from chapter two. And I will admit I taught this book for quite a few years before I finally noticed this scene. Props to my fellow teacher, Pete Flora, for pointing it out. There's a couple at the party, the McKees. Mr. McKee is described as a pale, feminine man who is a photographer. In the hurly-burly after the broken nose, he gets up to leave, and so does Nick. And this scene unfolds. Come to lunch someday, Mr. McKee suggested as we groaned down the elevator. Where? Anywhere. Keep your hands off the lever, snapped the elevator boy. I beg your pardon, said Mr. McKee with dignity. I didn't know I was touching it. All right, I agreed. I'll be glad to. Then the next paragraph begins with an ellipsis. And then Nick says, I was standing beside his bed, and he was sitting up between the sheets, clad in his underwear, with a great portfolio in his hands. Then I was lying half asleep in the cold lower level of the Pennsylvania station, staring at the morning Tribune, waiting for the four o'clock train. I know, I know, when you read it like that, all isolated and with emphasis, it seems pretty clear that McKee and Nick got it on. But when you read it at the end of the drunken party scene, it feels just like another absurd, blurry moment in a long night of them. What was Fitzgerald up to? I have no earthly idea. I'll just say that it's a gift to the queer canon and leave it at that. I do find it interesting, though, after our discussion in the last episode about queer signaling in The Haunting of Hill House. Interesting that these writers, both of whom were married and not rumored to be gay, wanted to speak of queerness without speaking of it. I like it. And I can tell you, my queer students like it very much. It's like finding an Easter egg in a video game. Blue gardens, yellow cocktail music, turkeys bewitched to a dark gold, and a bar with a real brass rail, stocked with gin and liquors and cordials long forgotten. Because, you know, it's 1922, and liquor is illegal, for Christ's sake. Finally, you have arrived at a Gatsby party. Welcome to Chapter 3. It is not until halfway through this chapter, which puts us almost a quarter of the way into the novel as a whole, that we meet the titular character himself. Before we meet him, we hear more rumors about him, humming through the moonlight summer air like a familiar tune. He's a killer. He was a German spy. He's an Oxford man. He killed a man. A woman tells a story about how she tore her dress at one of his parties, and he bought her a new one. $265, she says. Her friend says, there's something funny about a fellow who will do that. Um, you're welcome? One more scene, and then finally, I promise, we are going to meet the guy. So Nick wanders into the library and finds a, quote, stout middle-aged man with enormous owl-eyed spectacles ogling Gatsby's books. He says rather importantly, they're real. In other words, these aren't decorators' books. They aren't cardboard. But then he asks, what thoroughness, what realism? New one to stop, too. Didn't cut the pages. So what does this mean? Well, once upon a time, books were printed on large sheets and then folded and bound, and you had to cut the folds if you wanted to read them. That is why some books today come with ragged edges on the pages to simulate this past cutting need. So Gatsby is hella authentic, but still pretending. He's just really, really good at it. So what is this guy's game anyway? Nick wanders out of the library and strikes up a conversation with a man 
who thinks he recognizes Nick from the war. This man then offers to take Nick for a ride on a hydroplane the next day. Want to go with me, old sport? So Nick is like, yeah, sure, whatever. So, like, is this your first Gatsby party? And, like, where the hell is he? And the man says, I'm Gatsby. Finally, we are on page 48. And yes, yes, old sport is totally a cocktail party takeaway. It's Gatsby's signature line. He loves calling people that. So even though it is annoying of me, I'm going to save the description Nick gives us from his first impression of Gatsby. It's important later, and I don't want to go over it twice. I'll just say he calls him an elegant young roughneck, a year or two over 30, whose elaborate formality of speech just missed being absurd. Oh, and Nick likes him instantly, a lot. Again, let's park that scene in the parking lot for later. So final takeaway from this chapter. It ends with the first of what will be a series of car wrecks in this novel. Okay, class, what do we call a dominant feature or recurring symbol in a piece of literature? A motif. So as everyone goes from fun drunk to ugly drunk, they start to leave. And like a band of 16-year-olds leaving their first kegger, it doesn't go well. A car has wrecked in a ditch and has been, quote, violently shorn of one wheel. There's a moment of confusion about who was actually driving the car. Everyone at first thought it was allies from the library, but it was some other sloshed fella. Everyone points fingers at the amputated wheel. Put that in the parking lot for later, too. In chapter four, Nick goes into the city again, this time with Gatsby in Gatsby's car. It's pretty, isn't it, old sport? Gatsby says to Nick. What is it about rich guys needing affirmation that their toys are nice? Nick describes the car for us. It was a rich cream color, bright with nickel, swollen here and there in its monstrous length with triumphant hat boxes and supper boxes and tool boxes and terrace with a labyrinth of windshields that mirrored a dozen suns. Sitting down between many layers of glass in a sort of leather green conservatory, we started to town. I'm going to tell you something about my life, Gatsby announces. I'll tell you God's truth. Okay. Nick really has nowhere to go, so he's all ears. Gatsby explains that he is the son of, quote, some wealthy people in the Middle West, all dead now, and that he was educated at Oxford because it's a family tradition. Nick senses a lie and feels there is something, quote, a little sinister about him. Nick follows up on the geography, being a Midwestern man himself. Whereabouts in the Midwest, he asks. Gatsby's response, San Francisco. I see, says Nick. Gatsby either hasn't seen a map lately or is making this stuff up as he goes along. Gatsby then goes on to say he lived like a young Raja all over the capitals of Europe, collecting jewels, chiefly rubies, hunting big game, painting a little, things for myself only, and trying to forget something very sad that happened to me long ago. Nick's response? Same as yours, I would hope. He is imagining someone close to him dying so that he can keep a straight face and not burst out laughing. Tell me more about this European big game hunting old sport. Nick literally says he was imagining a turbaned character pursuing a tiger through Paris's Bois de Boulogne. Then came the war, old sport, Gatsby goes on, and I tried very hard to die. He then details a much more authentic-sounding war story that ends with him a hero, decorated by every allied government. Even, he says, little Montenegro, down on the Adriatic Sea. And there is something about this story that catches Nick's attention. Little Montenegro, Nick exclaims in his narration, Gatsby's smile comprehended Montenegro, he writes, appreciated its history. And then Gatsby reaches in his pocket, and a piece of metal, hung from a ribbon, falls in Nick's palm. That's the one from Montenegro, Gatsby says. Then he pulls out a photograph of himself and some other chaps at Oxford. And that is all it takes. These two relics become proof for Nick that Gatsby is not lying. Then it was all true, he writes. So this is weird. I mean, sure, maybe the war stuff and the Oxford stuff is true, but he didn't pull out a cheetah skin or a giant ruby. Anyway, it's enough for Nick. He is sold. This new friend is the real deal. And Gatsby knows it 
because this is the moment he tells Nick he is going to make a big request of him today. I told you all this, he says, because I didn't want you to think I was just some nobody. As they drive into the city, there is this stunning paragraph. Over the great bridge, with the sunlight through the girders, making a constant flicker upon the moving cars, with the city rising up across the river in white heaps and sugar lumps, all built with a wish out of non-olfactory money. The city seen from the Queensboro Bridge is always the city seen for the first time in its first wild promise of all the mystery and beauty in the world. So in case you are wondering, non-olfactory means made without smell. I am assuming he is referring to some sort of money made without breaking a sweat or getting your hands dirty. The idea of New York as this impossible place made out of sugar and a wish is just perfect. And to imagine that even in 1922, that vision of New York from that bridge was exactly the same as it is today every time I take a cab into the city from LaGuardia. New York can change its skyline, its mayor, its favorite restaurant, but there is something in its essence that never changes. I love that Fitzgerald so totally nails this. And then he follows it with this line, a dead man passed in a hearse heaped with blooms. This line turns the whole picture into a memento mori painting. That American dream that New York epitomizes, yeah, that one with the lumps of sugar made of money from people who think they poop rainbows, yeah, that's dying, may already be dead. This is a clear signal from Fitzgerald that while this novel may be about the American dream, it ain't all bootstraps and rainbows. Something's rotten in the state of, oh wait, that's Hamlet. So Gatsby and Nick enter a genuine speakeasy and meet Mr. Wolfsheim, whose description is more than a little anti-Semitic, and I can't honestly figure out if Nick is being the anti-Semite or Fitzgerald or both. But one thing is for sure, this guy is a 100% straight out of central casting mobster. After telling a few lovely stories about mob hits and then mistaking Nick for someone who wants to make a business connection, Wolfsheim tells Nick, when Gatsby is away from the table, that Gatsby is a fine fellow and a, quote, Oxford man. Then he casually shows Nick his cufflinks, which to Nick look like, quote, oddly familiar pieces of ivory. Finest specimens of human molars, Wolfsheim says with pride. So Nick is a classic preppy boy way out of his depth. Well, he says, that's a very interesting idea. And then so cute, he asks Gatsby if Wolfsheim is a dentist. Dork. Gatsby tries to be casual but truthful. He's a gambler, he says. He's the man who fixed the World Series back in 1919. This is, of course, a reference to the infamous Black Sox scandal when several members of the Chicago White Sox conspired with gambler Arnold Rothstein to throw the World Series. Nick's moral indignation is beautiful. The idea staggered me. I thought of it as a thing that merely happened, the end of some inevitable chain. It never occurred to me that one man could start to play with the faith of 50 million people with the single-mindedness of a burglar blowing a safe. Nick is the voice of an innocent idea of America, one where sacred institutions, such as baseball once was, could not be tampered with by the likes of a lowly gangster. But alas. Okay, so now the plot, which for sure has been entertaining, thickens. Gatsby asks Nick to go have tea at the plaza with Jordan, who is going to be in charge of asking Nick the huge favor Gatsby talked about at the beginning of the chapter. So Jordan explains to Nick that she and Daisy Buchanan, who was then Daisy Fay, grew up together in Louisville, Kentucky. Daisy Fay. Her name basically means flower fairy, which is sort of perfect. So in 1917, Daisy is the richest, most popular girl in town. She always wears white and drives a little white roadster, and she is madly in love with a young soldier from the local military base. This young soldier is none other than Jay Gatsby. Well, Gatsby gets shipped off to Europe, and Daisy gets bored or something, and becomes affianced to Tom Buchanan. But then right before the wedding, she gets a letter, presumably from Gatsby. 
she gets, quote, drunk as a monkey for the first time in her life and starts slurring, tell him there's a change of mind. Jordan and a maid dunk her in a tub and clean her up and boom, she is baptized in love with Tom, marries him, and even seems to dote on him, even though he cheats on her almost from the start. Here comes car wreck number two, class. Tom ran into a wagon on the Ventura Road one night and ripped a front wheel off his car. Weird, the first wreck also resulted in an amputated wheel. Hmm. The girl who was with him got in the papers, too, because her arm was broken. She was one of the chambermaids in the hotel where Tom and Daisy were staying. So then, as we heard in Chapter 1, Daisy hears Nick say he lives next door to Gatsby. And she's like, Gatsby? What Gatsby? To which Nick naturally says to Jordan, yeah, that's super weird and coincidental that they live right across from each other now. Except it's not a coincidence. Jordan explains, quote, Gatsby bought that house so that Daisy would be just across the bay. Now, I am a fool for a grand romantic gesture, and if this ain't one, then I don't know what is. Nick then writes, then it had not been merely the stars to which he had aspired on that June night. He came alive to me, delivered suddenly from the womb of his purposeless splendor. Okay, so what's the big favor? Gatsby wants Nick to invite Daisy over to Nick's house for tea. Then he can come over and they can be reunited. Why at Nick's house? He wants her to see his house, Jordan explains. So the day of the big reunion arrives and poor Gatsby is an absolute wreck. He sends his guy to cut Nick's lawn he sends a greenhouse worth of flowers to be arranged all around Nick's cottage. He arrives with dark circles under his eyes, dressed in a white flannel suit, silver shirt, and gold-colored tie. There's a fantastically awkward scene, well played by DiCaprio in the Baz Luhrmann movie. But after the initial jitters and discomfort, they figure out their way to one another. Nick leaves and comes back, and when he does, Daisy has been crying and Gatsby, quote, literally glowed. So they go over to tour the mansion, and then there's that shirt scene, so famous, where he starts hurling his bespoke linen and silk and flannel shirts in a great pile on a table. And what does Daisy do? Quote, she began to cry stormily. There's such beautiful shirts, she sobbed. Her voice muffled in the thick folds. It makes me sad, because I've never seen such such beautiful shirts before. Now, this is probably the time to tell you that I don't like Daisy. I know this is supposed to be a metaphor for all she missed because she didn't wait for Gatsby to come home from the war. But seriously, it just seems kind of shallow. Added to the list of flimsy things about Miss Flower Fairy. What do you do when a dream comes true? That is the question I always ask myself as I read the pages where Gatsby takes Daisy through the fairy tale he made just for her, his larger-than-life life, his love mansion. He was, quote, consumed with wonder at her presence. He had been full of the idea for so long, dreamed it right through to the end, waited with his teeth set, so to speak, at an inconceivable pitch of intensity. Indeed, Gatsby imbues Daisy, who to me is an insubstantial rich girl, with almost religious significance. Gatsby shows Daisy that he can see the green light of her dock across the bay, and Nick wonders if, quote, the colossal significance of that light had now vanished forever. Now that he had her again, it was just again a green light on a dock. His count of enchanted objects had diminished by one. Lights on docks are not generally green, I wonder if Fitzgerald made this one green to signify what? Envy, maybe? Money? Park that last thought in the parking lot. At the end of the chapter, Nick wonders if Daisy in the flesh could have possibly lived up to the five-year project to win her back. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything, he writes. Nick observed that it seemed to be her voice that held him most. That voice was a deathless song. Put that voice thing in the parking lot for later, too. I know, I know, it sounds like it's getting crowded, but it's a deck, there's plenty of room. So I want to end this first installment of the Gatsby series 
by giving you some biographical information on Fitzgerald that will sound familiar now that we're halfway through this novel. Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald was born in St. Paul, Minnesota on September 24, 1896, so he was a Midwesterner like his main character, Gatsby, who really is, and we will get to that when we head into Chapter 6. He attended Princeton, and in 1917, he enlisted in the Army. He was stationed in Mobile, Alabama, where he met the beautiful socialite Zelda Sayre. Right, you got this. Just change Mobile for Louisville and Zelda for Daisy and voila. They didn't get married right away, and indeed, it seemed he was not quite well enough for her. So after the war, he went to New York to try to make enough money in advertising to win her heart. Of course, he hated it and quit and did what God intended and wrote his first novel, This Side of Paradise, which is set on Princeton's campus. The novel made him famous, and just like that, Zelda was now interested. They married and lived happily, well, not so happily ever after, well, not really ever after, because they both kind of cracked up and died young. If you enjoyed this episode of Cocktail Party Takeaways, please rate it, leave a review, download it, follow it, or however else you can show the love on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen. In the next episode, we will continue examining The Great Gatsby, beginning at chapter six. Remember how in the introductory episode, I leveled the takeaways depending on the kind of party you're attending? I invite you, the listeners, to give it a try. Maybe you thought other parts of the podcast were better takeaways than the ones I came up with. I welcome any and all suggestions. So let's get social. Follow me on Twitter at AnneRochelle67. That's A-N-N-E-R-O-C-H-E-L-L 67. That's where you can contribute your very own takeaways. For some more information about me or about the podcast, go to AnneRochelle.com. That's Anne with an E, Rochelle without. And please, if you like the podcast, tell a friend. Cocktail Party Takeaways is produced by Gus Kenigsmark with original music by Gus Kenigsmark. Cover art by Stuart Key. Cheers, and let's all read more. <laughs>